you for being here to help us explore the range of solutions and strategies available to consumers to combat the scourge of robocalls, <laughs> caller ID spoofing, and telemarketing scams. It is critical that we help consumers understand their options when it comes to robocalls and spoofing. For example, consumers can download robocall blocking apps for their mobile phones and, con and contact their landline wireless providers for call blocking options. They can register their home or mobile phones with the National Do Not Call Registry, which protects their number from legitimate uh, telemarketing calls they do not want to receive. And there are other common sense strategies like not answering your calls from unknown numbers and not following any prompts if you do not know who the call is from. For example, do not press one to take your name off this list. Good options are available, but I think all of us, including industry, can and should do a better job of education, particularly with our seniors, to make sure that new scam ideas are stopped quickly. So what's a robocall? When the phone rings with an automated, automated pre-recorded telemarketing message, that's a robocall. They're a nuisance and they're illegal. Yet every day, tens of thousands of American consumers report receiving a robocall. And I'd like to just play a real quick robocall, quote unquote, from the IRS. This matter is very serious emergency and time sensitive. We are calling you from investigation team of IRS. This matter is. And that message goes on. And a staggering 3.2 billion robocalls were placed nationwide in the month of March, according to one source alone. In Ohio's 419 area code alone, my area code, nearly 12 million robocalls were placed. For every month in the past year, robocalls made up the majority of do not call registry complaints at the Federal Trade Commission. As technology evolves, allowing for a greater volume of robocalls, so are the tactics used to trick consumers into answering. In the past, scammers would fake caller ID information to trick consumers into thinking their bank was calling or the phone number was unknown. Scammers are now deliberately falsifying caller ID information knowing I'm likely to answer a phone call that appears to be local from my family, a doctor, or the church. Neighbor, neighbor spoofing, as it is known, is a deliberate tactic behind unwanted calls and texts to both wireline and wireless phones. Robocalls and spoofing have the potential for real financial harm. Fraud from unwanted calls amounts to almost $9.5 billion annually, according to the FTC. It's not hard to see how scammers could use deceptive tactics to convince people, often senior citizens, to hand over their personal information or to purchase fraudulent goods or services. Take the IRS tax scam, for example. You get that unexpected phone message claiming to be from the IRS. The call might say you owe taxes that must be paid immediately with a credit card or a debit card. Scammers have been known to use the threat of a lawsuit or arrest by the police to convince victims to hand over bank account information. Consumers may also get out of the blue calls offering to help them lower debt or interest rates or promising other limited time deals. Senior citizens are often targets of elderly specific robo scams relating to Medicare, health care, or funeral arrangements. But they are not the only ones who fall victim to these scams. Fortunately, American consumers have options and strategies to fight robocalls and caller ID spoofing and to protect themselves, which we will explore today with our witnesses. The technology and tactics used by scammers may change, but as the subcommittee, as subcommittee chairman, I remain focused on empowering consumers and keeping them safe from unfair, deceptive, and malicious practices. Again, I want to thank our witnesses for being here today, and with that, I will yield back and recognize the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding today's hearing on robocalls and spoofing. And thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Robocalls are a great annoyance for American families, especially American seniors. One third of the calls now are unwanted robocalls. Just in March, a record three billion robocalls were placed to American consumers, and about a quarter of those calls are scam calls. We're now at a point in my household when the hard line rings, I tell my husband, don't answer it. And he thought I didn't pay our taxes. He got pretty upset with me, actually. It took me a while to convince him I had. I hear repeatedly from my constituents that they want these calls to stop. One constituent in Ann Arbor wrote, my landline and cell numbers are both on the federal do not call registry. I checked. 
I'm so angry about all the calls from offshore call banks telling me that my computer is broken or that I need help with medical insurance and my college loans. Exactly what does the do not call list do? Not answering and letting someone call back isn't an option as I have an elderly parent who does call. I'm also not wanting to go to the expense of updating my info system to get caller ID. There were many more just like this, and to no one's surprise, there wasn't one letter in support of robocalls. Democrats on the Energy and Commerce Committee have been listening to their constituents and we're taking action. This week, Democrats are introducing three bills to help stop robocalls. Ranking member Pallone introduced the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act, which would strengthen the Telephone Consumer Protection Act and help the FCC take action against robocallers. Congresswoman Eshoo introduced the Hang-Up Act, which would require debt collectors contracted with the federal government to get consumers' permission before robocalling or auto-dialing consumers. And last, but certainly not least, today we have released a discussion draft titled the Cease Robocalls Act. This draft legislation would lift the common carrier exemption in the Federal Trade Commission Act so that the FTC can take action against these smaller voice over internet protocol, VoIP, otherwise called VoIP services, that are a huge player and heavily involved in illegal robocalls. I'm looking forward to getting feedback from all of you today about the discussion draft. Today, we'll hear from witnesses about some of the exciting and promising tools available to consumers wishing to block robocalls. But consumers don't just need new tools. They need new protections. We've put forward common sense ideas to stop Americans from being harassed by unwanted calls. I hope we can all work together to move this legislation forward and make progress on the issue because many of us are growing tired of having to leave your phone on silence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back my time. Well, thank you very much. The general lady yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, the chairman of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I share the passion of the rest of the members here about these unwanted, unnecessary, and oftentimes fraudulent calls. I get them on my cell phone all the time. They appear to be coming from, I think, my home at times. They're that good anymore. And uh, I, I, we got to do something about this. And we have, I'm going to talk about that in my opening statement here a bit, and then we appreciate our, our witnesses uh, for being here. Robocalls and caller ID spoofing have exploded in recent years. Three billion calls placed last month alone, they estimate. And we all get them. And they interrupt our dinners, they interrupt our family time, they interrupt meetings. Um, they, uh, they're real annoying, to say the least. At worst, they have the potential to scam and defraud both consumers and seniors and others. According to the Department of Justice, scams targeting the elderly are increasing dramatically, and fraudsters steal an estimated $3 billion from American seniors every year. It's now more important than ever to educate consumers on how to detect and avoid fraud stemming from these robocalls. Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, as well as our committee, have taken steps to protect consumers from robocalls and spoofing. Both the FTC and the FCC operate consumer complaint websites and hotlines where consumers can report illegal telemarketing calls. Reporting can help the agencies crack down on illegal callers and improve the data they share with the industry players and telecommunications companies who then develop solutions. Federal Trade Commission also manages the Do Not Call Registry, where anyone can register their home or mobile phone for free. Here at the committee, we recently passed the Ray Bombs Act, which includes provisions directing the Federal Communications Commission to expand and clarify the prohibition on misleading or spoofed caller ID information. It also requires that they, in consultation with the Federal Trade Commission, create consumer education materials on how to avoid this type of spoofing. These provisions were signed into law by the President in March. This is just one of many steps in the right direction, but as communication technology continues to advance, so do the tools and tactics of these illegal telemarketers. And they use those tactics and tools to evade existing protection. So we have to stay ahead of them. So-called neighbor spoofing is one of the most effective new tactics. It's particularly hard to detect. Scammers use phone numbers with your area code. 
uh, and, and or an area code nearby, and that gets your trust. Many consumers are likely to answer when it looks like the call could be coming from, let's say, their child's school, their local church, or their dentist's office. What do we need to do to stop these bad actors? As I said earlier, I, for one, I'm pretty sick and tired of them. We also finished up another tax season last week. IRS scammers are uh, uh, going after uh, taxpayers as well. Using the internet and social media, fraudsters can convincingly portray IRS employees by uh, naming a few identifying facts like your home address or current city of residence to avoid falling prey to these calls and others uh, never give personal identifiable information over the phone. Government officials will never ask you for your bank account information or social security number over the phone. Consumers should hang up and then they should call the IRS office, check to, if it was a legitimate call. And the bad actors keep evolving, so we need to make sure that our consumers have what they need to stay ahead of them. There are a wide array of technical and marketplace solutions consumers can use to block, avoid, or otherwise protect themselves from robocalls or caller ID spoofing. There are now 500, 500 call blocking apps for Android, Apple, and other devices. Many home providers, uh, phone providers offer the option to add robocall blocking functions for their service for free. And today, because of our witnesses, we'll hear from some of these innovators. And again, we thank you for your work and your willingness to be here. Uh, I've found, too, if I just let it go to voicemail, they never leave a voicemail. And then I know it's just a spoof. So anyway, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thanks for holding this hearing. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. I just want to thank you and the ranking member for holding this hearing. This is one of the biggest complaints I get from my senior citizens. And, uh, and actually, at my house, when I go back home uh, after a week, I get uh, calls saying the IRS is going to attack, uh, come over and uh, I owe taxes. And I, I hear constituents complain about that. And I explain to them the IRS doesn't call you and tell you by phone. Uh, you'll get a letter and, and keep in touch with us. Uh, the other frustration is that on my cell phone, I haven't applied for a loan for many years, but I keep getting these texts saying, your $250,000 loan has been approved. Uh, I thought about saying, send it to me and I'll go to Costa Rica or someplace. <laughs> but uh, it's frustrating to seniors, particularly who are home all day, and, and or young mothers who have children that they're worried about that, with all these kind of calls. So we need to, uh, both the two agencies, the FCC and FTC, see what we can do if they don't have the tools for it, we need to do it. And I thank you for having the hearing. Well, thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and that will conclude the member opening statements. The chair would like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members' opening statements will be made part of the record. And again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here with us today, to taking time to testify before the subcommittee. Today's witnesses will have the opportunity to give five-minute opening statements, followed by a round of questions from the members. Our witness panel for today's hearing include Mr. Ethan Garr, the Chief Product Officer of RoboKiller, Mr. Aaron Foss, founder of, is it, I want to make sure I get this, is it No, no More Robo? No More Robo? Ms. Maureen Mahoney, the uh, Policy Analyst at uh, Consumers Union, and also Mr. Scott and Beacon, the Executive Vice President of Technology and Solution Development at First Orion. So again, we want to thank you very much for being here. And Mr. Gar, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I think we're going to begin with a clip. So congratulations oh are in order. Oh, my God. <laughs> you are so awesome on this. Oh, my God. I can't. I, I, I told you it was going to be awesome. Dude. Oh no! Oh. What? Oh my God! Are you watching the television right now? Do you see what's happening? No. What's going on? Oh my God! You got to turn on the news. This is awful. Oh no! Chairman Lada and members of the committee, I'm Ethan Gar from RoboKiller, and what you just heard was one of our answer bots wasting a telemarketer's time. Answer bots are the solution to the robocall epidemic, and on June 19th, 2021. RoboKiller and our answer bots will have solved this problem. See, on that date, at our current trajectory, we'll have 10 million users deploying hundreds of millions of our time-wasting answer bots. This will reduce spammers' revenue by more than 50%. That's enough of a disruption to their bottom line to put them out of business. We're attacking spammers where it hurts, in their wallets. RoboKiller answers the calls it blocks with these answer bots, and they're smart. 
They know how to press one to reach the human behind Rachel from Cardholder Services. They know how to turn the tables on spammers and waste their time instead of yours. This is time that they no longer have to scam and steal, not just from our users, but from anyone else as well. This problem has gotten worse despite call blocking technologies, despite legislation and enforcement, but we are different. Our call blocking competitors have approached this problem from the caller ID angle, but spoofing, caller ID blocking, and other tools limit the value of such approaches. It's a cat and mouse game that can really never be won. We're not interested in playing the game. We'd rather steal the cheese that the spammers are after. The spammer's business model is based on making billions of calls, knowing that only a small percentage will get answered, and an even smaller percentage of those will connect human telemarketers with viable targets. They don't have to be surgical in their strikes. Robocalls let the most vulnerable in our society self-select themselves as victims. So a relatively small pool of humans, often on the other side of the world, are just waiting for their auto-dialed robocall systems to connect, waiting for someone's grandmother to press one and say hello. But answer bots, inanimate identities cannot be stolen. Their invisible wallets can't be infiltrated. They can keep spammers wrapped up on calls for hours, and they're protecting you even if you don't have RoboKiller. Every minute our answer bots are engaging telemarketers is a minute they don't have to speak to someone else. Our competitors are helping their users, but they're also helping scammers. Telemarketers are happy to skip a well-educated executive with a call blocker app to get to the elderly grandmother who they know is more likely to fall victim to their scams. With answer bots, our users are helping everyone. Unfortunately, you can't solve this problem with legislation alone. A three-man IRS scam operation in a seedy, nondescript room in another country isn't worried that the long arm of the American justice system is ever going to knock on their door. As it, become, as it became cheaper and cheaper to make calls, the incentive to deploy more robocalls has increased exponentially, as did the incentive to ignore the laws. The Do Not Call registry did exactly what it was supposed to do, but unfortunately, not at all what people expected it to do. So stopping the tiny percentage of legal robocalls that fell under the Do Not Call list purview was almost no help to consumers who were expecting a panacea. Beyond the Do Not Call list, the government's effort have been well-intentioned and well-executed. They just don't have broad implications on the problem. Despite the FCC and FTC's well-publicized multi-million dollar enforcement actions, with that estimated $9.5 billion in yearly phone scam revenue, these efforts are just not a real deterrent. No, the real solution to this problem is already in the App Store, and it's called RoboKiller. And you can take pride in the fact that the government efforts have made this happen. We weren't in this fight until the FTC had the vision to look beyond legislation and enforcement towards innovation. When the FTC created Robocall's Humanity Strikes Back competition in 2015, they got us, Teltech, into this fight. We've been innovating for 14 years, helping consumers use technology to protect their privacy and security on their phones. From unmasking block calls with trap call to recording calls with tape call to helping people with their, keep their numbers secure with spoof card, we've always been focused on giving people control of their phones. The robocall competition ignited our passion and is accomplishing your goals to help Americans end the robocall epidemic. We've already started to see the impact. When we heard a telemarketer say in an exasperated voice, oh no, everyone's got robokiller today, we knew we had turned the tide. When we heard another angrily yell at one of our answer bots, oh, which one are you? The guy with the baby, the guy on the movie set? Then we knew we were winning the fight. From an adorable southern belle to a guy dealing with a gazelle running around his apartment, our robots are hilarious. But just as important, they are effective. Earlier this week, we were able to showcase RoboKiller and AnswerBots at the FTC and FCC's Joint Technology Expo. And today, we have the privilege of testifying in front of this subcommittee. If you want us to help you solve this problem, please do more of this. Help us get more attention so that we can speed up our growth. We're not worried about putting ourselves out of business by solving the problem. We've built a culture of innovation. So when the scammers start ringing doorbells after we've solved this problem, we'll have a solution for that too. AnswerBots wasted more than 25,000 hours of human telemarketers' time last month. For 150,000 users that represented hundreds of thousands of blocked calls, and the peace of mind that when their phone rang, it wasn't a harassing call from a scammer. For thousands of other Americans who have yet to purchase RoboKiller, that was 25,000 hours where they too were protected from those otherwise engaged telemarketers. This robocall problem has grown into a true epidemic. Ever since I've been speaking, 2,700 unwanted calls are being made to American citizens every second. But it's over. RoboKiller and our answer bots are on the case. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for your testimony today. And Mr. Foss, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lada, Ranking Member Pallone, members of the committee, 
Thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Aaron Foss. I'm the founder of Nomo Robo and the winner of the FTC Robocall Challenge. And since launching in 2013, Nomo Robo has stopped almost 650 million robocalls from reaching American citizens. And while that number is huge, it's a mere drop in the bucket of this problem. According to our data, approximately 40% of all calls on the landline network are unwanted robocalls. So I'm here today to give you a view from the trenches. And let me start off by telling you the good news. The same technology that created this problem, low-cost voice over IP service, is now being used to successfully stop it. In its first year, Nomo Robo stopped 15 million robocalls from reaching American consumers. That was in the entire first year. And we're now stopping double that amount every single month. Right? 30 million robocalls a month are being stopped by Nomo Robo. And this is much better than the old solution of only answer numbers that you recognize. And when I first started this crusade, carriers believed that FCC regulations prohibited them from blocking robocalls. But since the FCC clarified that those regulations do indeed allow robocall blocking, carriers have been quick to act. Today, Nomo Robo is supported by most of the major VoIP carriers in the United States and directly integrated with some of the largest. And mobile technology companies like Apple and Google have also done a great job in making their smartphone ecosystems robocall blocker friendly. They now allow developers to create and distribute robocall blocking apps to hundreds of millions of users. This wasn't always the case, especially when I started. And there used to be a lot of fear when it came to stopping robocalls. Many people thought that technology couldn't differentiate between good and bad robocalls. And Nomo Robo proved this incorrect. The service is 97% effective, and our false positive rate is only one-tenth of 1%. 1 so on the one hand, I know that for one, over 1 1.6 million Nomo Robo users, we've solved their robocall problem once and for all. Their phones are now peaceful and quiet, and I wish I could stop my testimony right there, and we could end the conversation right now. Unfortunately, I can't. It's a jungle out there, and the robocallers have started to use more advanced tricks and tactics. We have to continually stay one step ahead of the bad guys. Simple blacklists are no longer as effective in stopping robocalls as they once were. Uh, last summer, we noticed an explosion in neighbor spoofed calls. These are the calls where the robocall uses a, the robocall caller uses a fake number that looks very similar to the recipient's number. Uh, last summer, they used to represent less than 2% of all robocalls, but beginning in July of 2017, they represented almost 20% of all robocalls. That's a 10x increase. Now luckily, technology like Nomo Robo can quickly detect and stop new robocalling, robocalling patterns like neighbor spoofing. And while the carriers are also working on a solution, verifying and certifying caller ID, it's still years away. Robocallers are flexible and quickly and continually change their tactics. The tools to fight them also have to be flexible and adaptable. We're at a very interesting point in the robocall battle. Technology has proven that it's a safe and effective solution in the fight. Regulators have cleared the path for carriers to roll out robocall blocking solutions to their customers. Consumers have shown that they want these services, they trust these services, and are even willing to pay for these services. And robocall blocking is a virtuous cycle. The more people that use robocall blockers, the less effective robocalling becomes. The less effective robocalling becomes, the less robocalls are made. Everyone wins, except for the robocallers. And to close, I just want to remind everyone why we're solving this problem. This isn't just about stopping a minor annoyance. Robocalls present a significant threat, particularly to some of our most vulnerable citizens. And I was reminded of this the other day when I received the following email. As everybody knows, my testimony is sworn, so I'm really not making this up. <laughs> said, uh, my name is Phil. I just wanted to, you to know how thankful I am for your service. I have a bad brain injury and the calls I was getting fooled me. Thank you for offering the service for free. My income has been tough to manage and adding an extra cost, even small, can add up each month. I thank the con committee for continuing to do everything in its power to make robocall blocking solutions like Nomo Robo available to all Americans. Well, thank you for your testimony. And Ms. Mahoney, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lada, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I work for Consumers Union, the advocacy division of Consumer Reports, 
And since 2015, in response to complaints from thousands of consumers who told us that robocalls were their top consumer complaint, we've conducted our End Robocalls campaign, which calls on the major phone companies to offer to all of their customers free effective tools to block unwanted robocalls. Nearly three quarters of a million people have signed this petition. And they've told us that they're overwhelmed by the harmful, abusive, and irritating robocalls that intrude on their privacy, take their money, and allow scams to enter their homes. Robocalls have reached epidemic proportions. Since 2006, the number of complaints to the FTC about violations of the do not call list has exploded. And the volume of robocalls is on the rise as well. Last month, three billion robocalls were placed to consumers in the United States. Unwanted calls undermine the quality of the phone service for which consumers pay dearly. For example, sometimes these robocalling campaigns relentlessly target certain consumers. One consumer told us that she received an estimated 100 calls in a single day, which blocked incoming and outgoing calls for significant periods of time. Others have told us that unwanted incoming robocalls have delayed them from calling a medical professional. And robocalls cost consumers money. Um, vulnerable consumers such as the elderly may be unduly susceptible to telemarketing pitches for products that they don't want or need. Scam calls like Rachel from Card Services also seek to separate consumers from their money fraudulently. Consumers with prepaid or limited minute calling plans may end up paying for robocalls. And often consumers have to pay for call blocking devices or services, which further push the cost of robocalls onto consumers. We appreciate the progress that the phone companies, the FCC, and the FTC have made thus far in addressing robocalls. For example, AT&T and T-Mobile have begun to offer free robocall blocking tools to their customers. In addition, the FCC has approved new rules that give phone companies the leeway to immediately block certain clearly illegally spoofed calls that they see coming through their networks. They've also opened an inquiry into the development of caller ID authentication technology to address call spoofing. And the FTC has initiated a series of contests, as my co-panelists well know, to encourage developers to create and innovate anti-robocall technology. But more action is needed to fully address the robocall problem. The blocking under the FCC's new rules will not reach the vast majority of robocalls. Essential legal protections against robocalls under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or the TCPA, remain at risk. And enforcement efforts have not been enough to stop illegal robocalling. Therefore, we support the following additional reform, reforms. First, the FCC should require providers to offer technology to identify and block spoofed and unwanted calls. Congress can assist by supporting the Robocop Act, which would direct the FCC to develop rules to implement these technologies. Second, ensure that consumers have strong legal protections against unwanted calls. The DC Circuit Court of Appeals recently struck down portions of the FCC's 2015 rules covering the definition of an auto dialer and the safe harbor for robocalls made to reassign numbers. The FCC will likely open a proceeding to explore open issues related to the definition of an auto dialer, and we urge them to implement rules that maintain important protections against unwanted robocalls so that consumers have a means of controlling or stopping them. Third, increase protections against unwanted debt collection calls. Congress should pass the Hang-Up Act to remove the exemption placed in the TCPA for federal debt collection robocalls. While the exemption should never have been passed in the first place, um, we urge the FCC to issue rules to implement the provision to provide clarity and to ensure that consumers have a way to limit and stop these calls. And finally, empower the FTC to counter illegal calls. Congress should allocate to the FTC greater resources for enforcement and the development of anti-robocall technology. It should also remove the common carrier exemption in the FTC Act so that the FTC can directly call on phone service providers to be part of the solution. Thank you for your attention to this important consumer issue, and I look forward to addressing any questions you have. Thank you. And Mr. Hambeacon, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Latta, members of the subcommittee, thank you for giving me the opportunity to appear today. I am Scott Hambeacon, an executive with First Orion Corporation. Today, consumers are being scammed out of hundreds of millions of dollars and are now conditioned to not answer the phone unless they know who's calling. This lack of trust in the voice channel must change. First Orion partners with carriers to offer their subscribers protection from scams and unwanted calls. 
First Orion also offers consumers mobile apps such as Privacy Star to protect their cell phones from these calls. These offerings use sophisticated analytics to identify calls that are highly likely to be scams. First Orion analyzed over 34 billion calls this past year and labeled 3.5 billion of them scam likely, giving consumers a warning before they answer. In addition, consumers can opt in to blocking calls labeled scam likely, so their phone never rings. In 2017, we blocked over 500 million of these calls for consumers. Most of the larger carriers have launched some form of scam protection. First Orion is, chosen, is the chosen provider for T-Mobile's groundbreaking offering last year, deploying our scam likely solution to over 58 million subscribers for free. We also know there are over 500 apps in the Google Play and Apple App Stores that are free or available for a small monthly charge. Despite these efforts, we are still getting fraudulent and unwanted calls. The fraudsters are sophisticated, evolving their practices to avoid being labeled and blocked. They operate like a business and constantly change their tactics to appear legitimate. Scammers use methods that legitimate callers often use, such as pre-recorded messages, automated robocalls, and altering their caller ID, commonly referred to as spoofing. Some robocalls are legitimate and wanted, such as automated notices from your child's school, and yet some scams are not robocalls. Both are still growing. Spoofing's no different. Legal spoofing by a national pharmacy chain, letting customers know their prescription is ready, and spoofing the number for the local pharmacy is helpful. However, neighbor spoofing, inserting a random number with the same area code and prefix as the called number to get a consumer to answer a scam call is illegal and much harder to detect. Let me be clear. We are in an arms race, not a marathon with a finish line, at least until we make it unprofitable. Our approach provides consumers the best information available, who's calling and why, allowing consumers to decide if they should answer. We also allow consumers to block future calls from that number or call category. We offer more information, including a calling number, the company name if available, a call category, and the ability to file complaints that we send to the FTC. We take great care in applying labels using sophisticated algorithms based on calls we see, input from consumers, and many other sources of intelligence. No one piece of data ever generates a scam-likely label. Our labeling methods are constantly evolving to respond to new threats. In response to neighbor spoofing, we have evolved our analytics to soon start identifying individual calls, not just the calling number as scam likely. As a result, we expect the number of identified scam calls to rise from 12% today to 15%. Of course, any algorithmic approach has some errors. Reported cases of false positives are a fraction of 1% for us. So calling parties can easily fix an incorrect label, we launched calltransparency.com, a website that provides legitimate callers the opportunity to register their numbers and avoid the scam likely tag. The FCC has wisely established a light touch regulatory regime that allows continued development of call labeling and blocking solutions with the potential for profound consumer benefits. We also commend the multi-year FTC focus on these issues and their role with complex multi-agency enforcement actions. Finally, we will continue working with call originators to further enhance our solutions. Although we do oppose any regulation or industry efforts that may help scammers, such as call block indicator tones. To conclude, the one area where First Orion believes that industry and government can do more together is expanding consumer education about scam calls and what tools are available to them. Mr. Chairman, First Orion appreciates the opportunity to appear today. We are available to provide any additional information the committee may request. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all of our witnesses for being with us today. Um, we greatly appreciate the information, and that will conclude our witness uh, opening statements, and we'll move on to the five-minute questions from our members. And I'll recognize myself for five minutes Mr. Foss, uh, since you won the FTC robocall challenge, what are the challenges your company have experienced in getting NOMO robo developed and installed on landline and mobile phones? So I think that the major challenge that we had has changed. So when we first started off, it was absolutely the carrier integration problem, right? That seems to be thawing. 
What the major problem I think right now is is on the uh, con customer, the uh, consumer confusion side, right? I, I even hear this mentioned a lot now where people say to put your landline and your mobile number on the do not call list. Um, there is actually no point in putting your mobile number on the do not call list. The way the TCP is, TCPA is written, it's actually illegal to call mobile phones unless you have express written permission. So when I actually even hear things like, well, you know, my number is on the do not call list, why do I keep getting calls? When people say, well, put your mobile and your landline on the do not call list, then what are you gonna do there? I feel like it's very, very confusing right now. I think that's my biggest, the biggest problem with the adoption of these things is that consumers don't really understand. If they understood that there was these technologies that are available, if they understood where the, the government um, steps in and what it can do to, to help, I think that that would go a long way now. And going along with that then, uh, where have you received support and encouragement in that mission to protect your consumers? Where's that, where's that support been? From the consumers themselves. I mean, really when, uh, maybe this is just like, you know, an American trait, right? We, uh, uh, we have a, a great military, we have great uh, police, and people still uh, protect themselves in their own homes through various means, right? They, they have uh, firearms, they have security systems, right? Americans do take protecting themselves as a responsibility. So I think that the, the easiest place that we've been able to find it, when consumers understand that they can go and protect themselves, that they don't have to rely on the government, that they don't have to rely on the carriers, that really empowers consumers uh, to protect, it, uh, protect their lines. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garr, as a winner yourself, can you share the uh, challenges uh, and support for robo-killer companies experienced uh, since the FTC contest? Sure. Uh, I also would say that we've gotten incredible support from consumers. Uh, people are really angry about this problem. My uncle calls me up probably once every two months and screams about the robocalls and telemarketers he's dealing with. Consumers are passionate about solving this problem. So we see, especially in ratings and reviews, our customers are really passionate about what we're doing and they want us to succeed and make their lives better. Um, certainly the challenges are that scammers are constantly working at this problem too. So more randomness, uh, new technologies, that's always a challenge. We're always getting um, a lot of support from uh, the FTC and the FCC since, our, since we won the competition. Uh, we were really fortunate um, to be really partnered with these agencies. Um, again, being invited to speak today, having the chance to go to the Technology Expo on Monday, uh, these are really important to our growth. We really feel like our, we have a, a solution in RoboKiller and our answer bots that scales. The only way it scales is if we get the word out there. And being able to participate in things like this has really been a supportive part of the effort. Let me ask this, if I could ask uh, everyone real quickly, because uh, I don't have a lot of time, but what can be done to stimulate more uh, technological solutions and marketplace innovations to help consumers fight back against robocalls and spoofing? So maybe, Mr. Hambeacon, we can start with you and just work back down real quick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, we certainly think uh, awareness with consumers is a big part of that. Uh, the more complaints they file, the more data we have, uh, the more we'll be able to combat this. Uh, as you know, our business, uh, we look at labeling and giving consumers choice uh, in blocking these calls. And so the more information we have, uh, the more we can fight the, the scammers. Because what, what you have to realize is these scammers are very sophisticated. They're using data and technology today, much like a marketer, a direct marketer would, to target these individuals. And so to combat that, we need more data, more sophistication, and more analytics deployed in the carrier networks to detect that. Uh, Ms. Mahoney, uh, we've got about 40 seconds left. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we think the FCC should require the phone companies to implement uh, advanced call blocking technology. I think that will provide important incentives for perfecting and improving it. And we also commend the FTC for its efforts so far to spur this technology, and we think they should be allocated more funds to be able to continue, continue these efforts. Thank you. Ms. Foss, I've got 17 seconds. <laughs> I'm gonna go with educate, uh, education, making consumers aware of what's out there um, and showing them that it's a real solution. Thank you. Mr. Gore. In my very short time here, uh, real-time information is always useful. We can always use that to be more effective in deploying our answer bots to the, to the consumer, for the consumers. Well, thank you very much. My time has expired, and I recognize the gentlelady from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Ms. Mahoney, I would like to explore some of your testimony regarding the FTC's authority under the telemarketing sales rule to stop these illegal robocalls. I'm concerned by reports that there are a handful of small voice over internet protocol VoIP services that are enabling these calls. During the Senate hearing on this same topic last week, we learned that these small VoIP carriers openly advertise short duration calls, which is code for robocalls. They even offered to blend robocall traffic in with normal calls to avoid detection. Do you, Ms. Mahoney, are these VoIP services contributing to the proliferation of robocalls? Thank you for your question. Um, again, we commend the FTC for its work so far on um, the robocall issue, their enforcement efforts in particular. Um, but we did learn last week from the Senate hearing that there are carriers wherein their primary line of business is to carry this fraudulent traffic. Um, I think if the FTC had more authority to go after them, they could use their enforcement muscle to really help crack down on this illegal activity. Thank you. Do you think that going after the carriers that aid and abet illegal robocallers would help reduce the number of un unwanted callers? I do. I certainly think that shutting these operations down would be an effective enforcement tactic. But when it comes to these unscrupulous VoIP carriers, the FTC says its hands are tied because common carrier activities are exempt from the FTC Act. Today we're releasing a draft bill that would lift that exemption for FTC enforcement against illegal telemarketing and robocalls, something that the FTC has testified that they support in the past. Does consumer union support expanding the FTC's authority under the telemarketing sales rule to reach common carriers? We do. We think this is a good idea and will help the FTC crack down on this illegal activity. In 1990, Congress passed the Do Not Call Registry after hearing numerous complaints about unwanted calls. That law worked for a while, but one quick glance at your call history shows it's clearly not working anymore, and all of you have testified, making that clear, too, that we need to do something. Ms. Mahoney, do you agree that existing law is insufficient and more can be done here in Congress to help consumers rid themselves of these unwanted calls? Yes, uh, we've long been calling on the phone companies to offer free, effective anti-robocall blocking technology. We do think the FCC should require the phone companies to offer this technology so that all consumers are covered. Uh, for example, consumers with traditional landline phones um, do not have effective free protections against these robocalls. So those are important reforms that we would support. Thank you, and I yield back the remainder of my time, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. The gentlelady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, the chairman of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I was, uh, I was actually just trying to download one of your apps here. I'm, I'm real ready to do this. Um, look, I think we're all really frustrated. Uh, we now know that the Do Not Call Registry isn't that effective because these people are operating illegally to begin with. We've been through TCPA issues. It's already illegal to robocall a cell phone. Um, and it seems to me that technology holds the best promise here because we can make some changes in statute probably, but at the end of the day, isn't it really you all and, and your brain trusts that are gonna come up with the technology every day to try and stay ahead of the spoofers every day because they got people doing this, right? Do you want to address that? I mean, is there, what's the best thing a consumer can do, and what should we do to get at this? We passionately believe that disruption of the telemarketer's business is the key to solving this problem. Yep. We believe that our answer bots, which waste scammers' time, Love it. can solve this problem. Yes, they're entertaining. Yes, they're fun. Uh, yes, you can create your own. These are great things for consumers but they serve a really important, valuable purpose. That, again, is time, not just that our, our user is protected. If you're downloading RoboKiller right now, yes, you'll be protected from that call. But the great thing is that somebody else is being protected at the same time because the calls that we're blocking and answering with our answer bots are wasting those spammers' time. And I'm telling you, sometimes it's for 47 minutes at a time. <laughs> See, I really like that. Because <laughs> um, I want to get even with these people. Uh, I remember uh, a decade or so ago when pop-up ads were the rage on the internet. Every time you went to, I would work on a Word document or something, you'd have these pop-up ads. I, I threatened to do a death penalty for pop-up ad people. Because, I mean, you couldn't get anything done. 
And now we're all getting interrupted with these calls. I, by the way, I've just downloaded your app. I may move down the table here, but I'm, I'm going to be in the get even mode here real soon with these we're the, spammers. We're the get even guys. <laughs> I like that a lot because I think that's what you have to do is create economic harm on them because it's hard to chase them around the globe, right? And so when, when I get one of these calls, I've tried to like talk to them and they're really sweet, except they don't answer, it's a robo voice for a while. So what happens? Does somebody actually answer and what are they really after, just my financial information? It's, it really depends on the, on the nature of the call. Um, and again, like what's really incredible is how uh, effective they can be at reaching their victims. That IRS scam that was played at the beginning right. of this uh, testimony, that particular robocall asks you to call back a specific phone number. That means when you call them back, you're self-selecting yourself as a victim. They don't want people who have robo-killer. Wow. They don't want people who have another product. They want to get past them and get to the human. So they've got a sweatshop call center somewhere overseas, most likely. Most of this is going on overseas, right? Mm -hmm. They're not a monolith. I mean, I speak to a lot of scammers. I mean, you think it's a full-time <laughs> job for me. Is this your voice uh, on one of these? Uh, the one we played was my voice, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, we talk to a lot of these scammers. It's not one, there's not one image of them. It is three guys working together in disparate locations. It is a, a bullpen of 100 people. Um, I ask them, how many people are in your room? And sometimes you get, oh, there's none of, there's just me, it's just me. And sometimes you can hear people in the background. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. you can tell it's a big bullpen. Stunning, they're not truthful to you. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and exactly. We we really uh, encourage consumers not to trust anything the spammers say, not or or do. Don't press one to get off their list because why would you trust someone who's out to get you in the first place? Right. I, I was going to ask you that because they do have like press one if you want off. You do this or that. Bottom line, you should just hang up, right? Or no, do your deal. <laughs> yeah, if you have robo killer, we'll take care of it for you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think. If you're gonna engage, never give out personal identifying information. And so when, when somebody's using, let's just say your app, I'm trying not to hawk one service over another here, but let's say they use your app, is that counting against their phone minutes or anything like that? Our phone minutes, I mean, consumers? For our users? Uh, no. Uh, it's not tying up my phone line. No, 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 the, the call is being forwarded to us and then we're answering that call. So the user, uh, is just getting a notification on their phone saying we, RoboKiller has blocked this call, that it's a spam call. And how do you know that it's not a real call? That's our special sauce. We're using a lot of okay. tools. Uh, when we won the FTC's competition, we demonstrated how audio fingerprinting could be used to attack this problem. That's one of the tools we use, along with machine learning, um, lists that we, we find and build, uh, using our own consumers' mm -hmm. consumer information. Um, as we grow, we're building a larger and larger, larger ecosystem to learn from. Okay, my time has expired, but thank you all for the good work you're doing. This thank is you. what it's gonna take, and I am all about getting even with these people. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, again, for holding this hearing. Uh, Ms. Maloney, I appreciate the work con <coughs> Consumers Union <clears throat> does try to make Americans aware of options they do have to protect. I'm especially concerned about protecting those more vulnerable to fraud. Um, you think the elderly and specifically are likely to know about the apps and the technology that exists to protect them from robocalls? We think more consumers should be made aware of some of the options that are out there. Uh, we'd like to see consumers uh, taking more advantage of them. Uh, oftentimes, elderly consumers do have traditional landline phones um, and existing call blocking solutions um, are not adequate um, for those uh, types of phone service. So we would like to see more technologies that are available to them, um, as well as more education and awareness for these consumers to be able to take advantage of existing tools. Several witnesses have mentioned that AT&T and T-Mobile have begun offering free robocall blocking tools to at least to some of their customers. And I'm glad to hear, especially since you also mentioned that some of the competitors only provide products that consumers have to pay for. How can we explain why only some of their customers have access to these tools and not all their customers? 
Well, um, thank you for your question. Again, we think that all consumers should have uh, access to these tools, and we do think the FCC should require the phone companies to offer to all of their customers um, these tools. Um, I think it's possible that phone companies in the short term uh, do not see market incentives for providing these solutions to all of their customers. So that's why we'd like to see more pressure on them to take action. Thank you. Mr. Hamburgan, in your uh, testimony, you mentioned there are over 400 apps available to consumers that offer robocall and spoofing protection. Since these apps are so widely available, what do you think are the biggest obstacles to better protection from robocalls uh, for these consumers that are particularly vulnerable to scammers? Uh, thank you for your question, Congressman. The, uh, w one of the largest issues is that the, the scammers are, are very uh, savvy, very technologically savvy. And so uh, a lot of these apps work based off of just a list of numbers that are going to be blocked or identified. And so that takes time to compile that information. And what the scammers have learned is that rotating that number or these neighbor spoofing type solutions, they can avoid those simple lists of numbers that should be blocked. And so uh, you know, part of what First Orion is doing is developing technology that allows uh, us to rapidly look at all that information. And instead of just looking at the number, looking at the characteristics of the incoming call and identifying that information so that regardless of what number that scammer may call from, we can identify that information and block that call or label it uh, as a scam. Of these 500 apps that are available, what kinds of options are available to customers that don't have a smartphone? Well, that's, that's a, a tough one. Uh, most of the apps are really for the Google Play Store, for Android devices, the Apple uh, App Store, which are iOS devices, uh, uh, maybe a, a handful for Windows smartphones, but uh, for the feature phone, you really have to rely on the carrier's in-network uh, solution for any of that scam protection. Thank you, Mr. Chill. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Illinois, the vice chairman of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, and thank you all for being here. It's good to uh, have you here on this uh, really important issue. Um, I just downloaded one of your apps as well, and I've been getting calls all the time, and yeah, I just don't even answer my phone anymore. Um, so I'm eager to get a call and listen to the uh, exchange if it happens. Uh, but all of you appreciate you being here, and, and uh, we'll start out with uh, Mr. H. I think it's Hambicon, is that right? Okay, Hambicon. What's it about the distributed? You, you answered a little bit of this, but I want to see if there's anything you missed out on that. What's what is it about the distributed interconnection, interconnected nature of the internet that allows bad actors to provision cheap and easy robocalls over VoIP? Like, what's it about just the nature of it, I guess? Well, the, the, uh, I think the distributed nature of what you just described, the internet is connected, right? All of it's connected. And so what's happened is the, the cost for uh, any company to be able to create and launch call campaigns off the internet connected to the carrier networks, uh, the cost of that has come down so dramatically over the last couple of years, it makes it very easy for scammers to launch millions of calls uh, at very low cost. Um, and, and it's also helped cons the uh, legitimate businesses also reach their customers with legitimate services. Uh, so again, I think you know, what we've got to do is find ways to look at that data analyze that uh, information and apply it back into the carrier network. Let me ask more. So the, the internet itself obviously is old, relatively. <clears throat> but it seems like these, these calls have been increasing really in the last few months, maybe the last year, exponentially. Did something change or did they just figure something out? Uh, I, I think as the solutions are deployed and starting to stop some of the calls, so you've heard from all of us the number of calls that we've been able to block or deter, uh, the, the, again, the, the scammers are able to increase their volume, okay. so they're going to get their number of calls out there, whatever it takes to, to hit their number of scams. And to all the, uh, to all the industry representatives, uh, when a customer downloads your app, has your service added to their landline, what's their typical experience in the next few days and weeks? Zero robocalls, 90% reduction. Mr. Gar, if you want to start. 
We expect our customers to see more than 90% reduction in spam and telemarketing calls. Okay, Mr. Voss. Uh, we don't get any of the data back on the mobile side, right? There's a privacy issue over there, so I can't tell you the exact number, but what I will tell you is from the very moment that you install Nomo Robo, and if you go back to your recent call lists and we start labeling all those as robocallers, people will be like, wow, I, I knew that that's what that was. So mm. th from the very, very moment, they get a visceral feedback um, that it's working. About 12% of the calls that come to our consumers are uh, labeled scam likely. Okay. Mr. Foss, are you aware of uh, robocallers spoofing the telephone numbers of fire department, EMS, police, sheriff, anything like that? Yeah, so the um, spoofing known and good robocallers, even on our, like if there's something on a white list or something, uh, does happen. According to our data, it's very, very, uh, very, very small, and that attack is actually relatively easy to prevent. So, for instance, our, uh, with our blacklist solution, when an attack is actually going on, that number is on our blacklist. When the attack stops, it can be rolled off, and as we, um, talk to, uh, as we get integrated with more and more carriers and things, we can give those analytics back and we can tell those public safety organizations, hey, your numbers are, are being uh, spoofed, um, switch on over to see it's something like that. Uh, one of the new techniques that literally just started this week though, um, it actually happened, uh, it was attacking uh, some people in Texas and California, New York, and it was aimed at uh, Chinese Americans. And they were using a variation on um, uh, neighbor spoofing, they would call from a 212-244 number, which is where the Chinese consulate was. Mm. The message was in Mandarin, and when we started detecting this, we couldn't understand, because the messages, again, were all in Mandarin, we couldn't understand what was going on. When we looked at the analytics, and we looked at the area codes and the exchanges, that this robocaller was uh, targeting, it was absolutely places with high Asian populations. One of the ones that popped up was uh, Webster, Texas. Like, I don't understand, like, it, was, it was San Francisco, it was New York, those kinds of things, and then Webster, Texas. When you go and look at the demographic makeup um, of Webster, Texas, it's predominantly um, Asian. So these spoofing issues, yes, can they go and spoof real numbers like the Chinese consulate, like the um, public sa safety um, organizations? Yeah, but more importantly, it's, it's, it's much more important to stop them as they're happening in real time, report that back. That is a solvable problem. Thank you. Mr. Gar, in 10 seconds, do you have anything to add to that? I would just say that generally the bigger spammers, the cruise scams and things like that, are not using these highly targeted uh, attacks. It's less surgical. They don't need to do that. What they want to do is they just, again, they want to get past the people who are savvy enough to have call blocking apps and services and get to the people who are vulnerable. So they just want to make more and more calls, and that's why we feel that time is such an important factor here. We have to be hitting them where it hurts, which is in their wallet, and their wallet is connected directly to time, and that's how answer bots fight that problem. All right, thank you all for being here. Mr. Chairman, you back. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Illinois, the ranking member of the subcommittee for five minutes. Thank you. First, let me apologize. I had a, another meeting I had to be at, and so I'm sorry that I didn't hear your testimony. Um, I appreciate uh, the written testimony that I have, though. Um, and, you know, I've heard horror stories about debt collectors um, taking advantage of the uh, of robocall technology, harassing um, consumers, um, often several calls uh, a day to a single recipient, hundreds of calls a month, even after the recipient has asked that the calls stop. Um, and unfortunately, in 2015, Congress actually made it even easier for some debt collectors to harass consumers by allowing calls to be placed to a person's cell phone without the prior consent required for other robocalls. So let me ask uh, Ms. Mahoney, um, can you elaborate for us on what you're he hearing from consumers about harassment by debt collectors, and um, does debt collection make up a substantial portion of all robocalls? Great, thank you for your question. Uh, we've had a similar experience. We've heard from many consumers about unrelenting, harassing debt collection robocalls, and oftentimes they're intended for another person. And it's very difficult to get these calls to stop because uh, the caller does not believe that the consumer doesn't owe the debt. Um, we heard from one consumer who is on a fixed income as a limited minute cell phone plan, she's constantly receiving unwanted debt collection robocalls that are intended for someone else and can't get them to stop. So she's very frustrated that she's essentially paying for these robocalls. 
And there are a couple of reasons why there are so many of these debt collection robocalls. Um, I think there are strong incentives um, because of the inexpensive cost of sending out these messages for debt collectors to reach out to consumers. Um, also, as you note, um, exemption um, to the TCPA was um, slipped into the budget bill of 2015 that exempted debt collection robocalls made on behalf of the federal government, uh, for example, to collect federal student loan debt or tax debt. This was very unpopular uh, when it passed. Uh, nearly 200,000 consumers union activists reached out to the FCC to ask them to implement strong rules in order to limit them. So we don't think this provision should have been passed in the first place. We do think it should be removed, uh, for example, through the Hang Up Act. But in the meantime, the FCC has yet to finalize rules implementing this provision, and we do urge them to do so, um, so that there is some clarity around the issue and that consumers know how to stop these calls. Thank you. Um, I would agree with that. I don't see why any debt collector, even for a federal-backed loan, um, should be given free reign to harass consumers. Um, in 2016, the Federal Communications Commission voted to adopt protections that would have established guarantee, um, guardrails on these calls to limit their abuse, but um, those rules never went into effect. So, Ms. Mahoney, can you explain the status of those rules and do you support them being um, allowed to go into effect? Is that what you were referring to earlier? The FCC, okay. Right, exactly. So in the summer of 2016, the FCC did issue strong rules that would limit the amount of these debt collection robocalls that would be allowed to be sent to consumers without their consent and also provided them the opportunity to stop these calls uh, if they wanted to. Without these rules, um, consumers wouldn't have the ability to do so. Uh, however, those rules went to the OMB um, before they could go into effect, and in January 2017, they were withdrawn from consideration from they the were, OMB. They uh, were withdrawn. what? What did you say about consideration? They were dropped from? No. Um, I believe they were withdrawn by the FCC. Withdrawn, oh, okay. Um, so, um, you testified the Consumers Union supports a bill that would once again require federal debt collectors to comply with the same rules as any other robocaller. Um, Congressional, uh, Congresswoman um, Anna Eshoo um, is reintroducing the Hang Up Act, which you referred to here in the House. Until we pass legislation like the Hang Up Act, what are the minimum protections that you would want to see in place to stop abusive practices? Right, so until these rules are implemented, actually that provision does not go into effect. However, there is a lack of clarity around the issue, so we are concerned that consumers will still get these unwanted robocalls from federal debt collectors. Uh, we would like to see rules issued um, in the meantime so that consumers have additional protections against them. We would like to see that provision reversed, um, and we would like consumers to have the opportunity to block all unwanted calls um, through the expansion of technology that's available to them to do so. Great. Thank you. Now I yield back. Thank you. The gentle lady yields back, and the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing as well, uh, and I thank the panel for their testimony. Uh, this is a very important issue and affects our constituents. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Goy, you, you mentioned that uh, your technology uh, does not, uh, the, the, consti the constituent or the customer, uh, the person does not have to answer the phone. In other words, it does not affect them, it doesn't interrupt them at all. In other words, they just see on the caller ID that a call was made and you inter interrupt the call. Is that, is that correct? Yes, we block the call. You block the call. And then answer it with our answer bots. Okay, So good. the only thing that the customer... No inconvenience for the constituent. No, and all we do is we show them a notification on their phone so that they know that a call was received and that we blocked it. So we, our, our job is to give users control of their phone. I think what you're all talking about when you say, I don't even pick up my phone anymore. I, you know, we just, you know, we unplugged our landline. When you hear those stories, people are saying they've lost control of their phone. Yeah. Our job, what we're passionate about at Teltech with RoboKiller, is making sure people have control of their phone once again. And that's so very important because uh, 
a lot of times, uh, you know, when you have an elderly parent, uh, you want to make sure you pick up the phone. You never know. It's an emergency, and uh, it could be, I mean, I've, I pick, uh, you know, even with a mobile phone, I see robocall, but identify, I see the number, and I know it's somebody that I know. So, uh, you know, a lot of times I will pick up the phone. Absolutely. I mean, one of the our pioneering te te technologies is a product called Trap Call, which unmasks block calls, which is a problem that is still prevalent today, but was a huge deal uh, eight, nine years ago. It was all over the news. When people were getting block calls, it was really important for them to know who was calling from behind those block calls. Right. We wanted to find a way to give people back that control of their phone without disrupting their whole life, without changing the way they interact with their phones. Yeah, and, and, and for the rest of the panel, uh, is that the correct? I mean, all this other technology, uh, which is great, and thank you for continuing to innovate uh, until we solve this terrible problem. Uh, you're not interrupting the, the, uh, the consumer in any way. In other words, uh, the phone doesn't ring uh, during dinner or during your favorite uh, program. Is that correct as well? Correct. So on the mo on the land our landline pr uh, product, the phone will ring once, and then we answer it. it stops okay. ringing, they'll see the caller ID, so people can make sure that you know they know that it's working. On our mobile uh, product, we give consumers the option: do they want to identify it as a robocall, or just send it directly to voicemail? And in that case, it's even one better. Like we just you the only calls that come through are from people that you know or the calls that should happen. Um, this is a story that literally just happened last month. My uncle wound up in the hospital unexpectedly. You know, ambulance had to come and pick him up, um, and he called, and there was an un, I didn't recognize the number, but I, you know, I trust my product. I answered it. Turns out that he was in the hospital, and he told me what room he was. I had to go and pick up uh, some stuff from his, his house for him. If I didn't answer unknown calls, I don't know what would have happened. See? Um, yeah, and ironically, when that's I went to pick up That's a good example. His, that, that's the my greatest fear. That's exactly it, right? It's really fear. important. And again, I'm, this, is, uh, this is not a made-up story, right? And, and no joke, when I went to pick up his stuff, he has an old you know, flip phone, a feature phone. It rang, and I figured it was one of his friends who uh, you know, was calling to find out what's going on. I answer it, and no exaggeration, it's the you've won a free cruise. And so on that point, I, you know, I, was, I was laughing because of all that was going on, but I'm like, even I can't protect my uncle, because you know he doesn't have the latest technology. Um, so in one case, the robocall blocking apps actually, I was immediately able to get into the, uh, touch with the people that I care about that are having issues. And on the other hand, it was wait, this same call, the same technology could have taken advantage of my uncle. Anyone else want to comment on that? Uh, yes, Congressman. I'll just add that uh, at first run, consumer choice is paramount, and uh, for our default solutions in carrier networks. Uh, the labeling is what takes place. So you see the call with a label uh, of scam likely or some other uh, label. And then the consumer has the option to actually block any of these calls in the future uh, so that their phone won't ring. Uh, and for non-scam likely tags, those things can actually be forwarded over to their voicemail so they don't miss a call uh, if something did get blocked. I have a question here. I know I'm running out of time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, would, would you allow me to Ask the question, or I right, why don't I just uh, submit it for the record? But you know, I I just want to make a statement. To, uh, our our like our constituents should not have to deal with this. Okay, uh, they should have the right to enjoy the privacy in their own home, and uh, and uh, you know they, they shouldn't even have to play defense, in my opinion. So we have to do something about this. But I appreciate what you're doing to, to protect our constituents. Uh, but this is an issue we hear about on a daily basis from family members. My dad was a member of this committee. He complains to me all the time about these robocalls, and he's right. So uh, thank you very much for what you do. Thank you for holding the hearing, Mr. Chairman. And I'll yield back and submit the question. Thank you. The chairman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from New Jersey, the ranking member of the full committee, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to hear that industry groups have been working on technology to uh, root out caller ID spoofing with a system that can verify a call's true origin and the call authentication 
Trust Anchor has been in development for some time now. My questions are of Ms. Mahoney. Um, do you support creating a call authentication trust anchor so that consumers know who's really calling them? Thank you for your question. There is a broad consensus that caller ID authentication can be an important step in order to address the problem of call spoofing. And as my co-panelists have mentioned, uh, call spoofing and neighbor spoofing have become increasingly concerning. They do make it difficult for um, many call blocking technologies to function. They allow spoofers to hide detection, which makes enforcement difficult um, and generally just makes the robocall problem worse. So caller ID authentication has been in development for many years. This is a technology that would allow the originating provider to confirm or validate the accuracy of the caller ID information so that that can be traced all along the call path. And we'd like to see the phone companies be required to implement some form of caller ID authentication with a certain set of consumer-friendly standards. For example, it should be free. Um, it should have the capability to block uh, spoofed calls as well. Well, in July of last year, the FCC started a process to explore the creation of a call authentication trust anchor, but the effort seems to have stalled out. So today I'm releasing a discussion draft of the Stopping Bad Robocalls Act, and one provision of my draft bill would set a one-year deadline for the FCC to adopt rules to create such a trust anchor to ensure consumers know who's calling when they answer the phone. So again, Ms. Mahoney, do I understand correctly that Consumers Union supports a deadline to get this call authentication program in place? Again, thank you um, for your efforts to help spur this technology. Uh, we would like to see the FCC uh, issue rules and require the phone companies to implement this technology by a certain deadline. Now, how would creating a call authentication system help put an end to bad actors masking their call or ID information or spoofing and preying on unsuspecting consumers and seniors in particular? Well, um, since call spoofing has made it so difficult um, for call blocking, um, again, for enforcement efforts, and it tricks consumers into picking up their phone. Um, cracking down on call spoofing um, would improve the functioning of call blocking tools and it would allow consumers um, to trust their caller, identi caller identification information again. Now would an authentication system also make enforcement easier by helping track the source of illegal robocalls? Yes, um, that has been a focus of the phone companies um, in order to speed up this process. Uh, since calls are routed through multiple carriers, it can be time consuming to track them down to their original location. So phone companies have been exploring things like traceback to speed this process, but caller ID authentication would overall speed up this process and make it much more effective. Well, you mentioned in your testimony that because of a court ruling, the definition of auto dialer is unclear. In the wake of that uh, court case, do you generally support a, cl a clarification of that definition? Yes, um, the ball is in the FCC's court in order to clarify a definition of an auto dialer that protects all consumers um, and the uh, existing uh, auto dialers that are in use, um, but we appreciate any assistance in that. And I've also heard that many consumers are plagued by robocalls they receive as a result of reassigned uh, phone numbers. Do you support requiring the FCC to establish a nationwide database of consumer telephone numbers that have been reassigned to other consumers so we can help stop these annoying calls? Yes, we urge the FCC to implement regulations to create the reassigned number database as proposed uh, in order to cut down on this problem of wrong number robocalls. And the bill I released, uh, I mentioned, addresses the issue uh, with the definition of an auto dialer and would require the FCC to establish a database of reassigned numbers. Uh, I know we've heard a lot about neighbor spoofing, but I recently heard from a constituent about something perhaps even more alarming. Instead of the first six digits looking like her phone number so she would think it was a neighbor calling, the first six digits look like a phone number of a relative that frequently calls. I don't know how the spoofing companies would know what calls are coming in, but if there's some sort of access to caller information, I think we should stop it. So I just do you have any thoughts on this, this report that I'm mentioning? Um, I have not personally heard uh, from many consumers about this happening, but scammers are smart and they're constantly thinking of ways in order to 
trick consumers uh, into handing over their money or personal information, so I wouldn't um, put it past them. And certainly we hear often about neighbor spoofing uh, in which the first six, six digits are spoofed. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for this uh, timely uh, hearing. I got a Facebook uh, post on my feed the other day from a constituent. She said this, I realize we deregulated cell phone marketing a while back, woohoo, but the do not call options don't work. I'm on a do not call list, she said. I punched the number to take me off the list, and they just call from another number, a number that, by the way, you can't call back. Yes, you can block, and I do, but the bots just call from another number. What kind of scam business thinks this work? I wouldn't in a million years get their extended warranty, health insurance, et cetera. I too have uh, been called just recently by the IRS. Apparently I was involved in some tax fraud and if I didn't call them right away, uh, I faced jail time. I called them back or I answered one of their calls. It came right in, I can't remember if I called back or whatever, because I wanted to know. I told them who I was. Um, told them that I was going to investigate uh, whether they were legitimate. I said, if you're fraud, we'll find out, and the authorities will, will knock on your door. The guy offered to give me his badge number and to spell his name. Didn't do a very good job pronouncing his name and definitely couldn't spell it. Had to spell it per letter, A is an apple, and that sort of thing. Uh, I never did get his name right because he didn't speak English very well. Then just this week, I was called by the Social Security. They were out of Texas, but they called me and said that I was involved in Social Security fraud. For the people that are watching, the IRS does not call you and the Social Security Administration does not call your phone. They send you something in the mail and you call them. So I want all the, the people across America not to fall for this scam. But it raises an important uh, issue that we're talking about today and I want to ask you guys, let's take a hypothetical scenario that a robocaller would get hold of a home security company that a consumer uses, or a bank number even, a number that they would recognize, and they started using that. How would it work in your system if that happened, if they spoofed a legitimate number, not one of the cell phone uh, exchanges from my area that I would recognize, well, maybe that's somebody that I know and I don't have them in my contacts. They use a legitimate number that might be your local bank, and the consumer wouldn't complain about that number because they don't want to not have their bank call them, right? What would happen, and how would that work? Uh, it's a great question, and I think it's really important when you think about call blocking technology that it's just as important that you're removing numbers from the list that you are as adding numbers to the list, and that's what we think we do really well. Our algorithms are working in real time to understand patterns of calls, so what you're describing, if it happens, it's very unlikely that it's a single call coming from that number. It's multiple calls coming from the same number, uh, even if it's, they're spoofing a, number, you know, a, a legitimate number. We see that spike because we have a large ecosystem of users. We have, just on RoboKiller, 164,000 users now. Large ecosystem of users potentially seeing that call. If we're seeing that call in real time come in, we know that it's likely a scam, and we're able to prevent block against that. So we're able to adapt really quickly. And I think going back to what you're saying, uh, users, consumers should always remember when the phone rings, uh, my grandfather's principle, which is honest people are always willing to put things in writing. So if you get a call and someone's asking you for personally identifying information, even a company you work with, ask yourself why and say, you know what, if you want to ask me that question, send me a certified letter. Scammers aren't going to take the time. Again, this is all about time. Scammers want to get past you as a skeptic and get to somebody they can, they can, they can target. They want and, to get to the vulnerable people. And it is the seniors that are the most vulnerable in this. And I really think there ought to be a public service uh, uh, commercial that runs on the TV during the time that seniors are watching to warn them that the IRS will never call you. Don't give any of your personal. We've done a lot. All of us have done uh, messaging within, within our uh, ability. Let me ask you this. Could they theoret theoretically spoof the House of Representatives number and put that in the? Sure. Uh, Caller ID is not something that you should automatically trust or, or can automatically trust. But spoofing is a complicated issue. I mean, 
I, I, have, I don't know what phone system you use, but there's a very good chance that the phone system in this building spoofs calls. Um, it, spoofing is not a monolith. Spoofing is used for legitimate purposes all the time. Uh, so you can't... Spoofing is used for legitimate purposes all the time? Absolutely. Uh, Give me an example. Give the committee an example of that. Sure. My stepfather is a veterinarian. When he calls his customers, when he has to call a client back in, at night for an emergency, he spoofs his office number so that he's not giving away his personal home number or mobile number, and also so that the user, that his customer knows that it's him calling, it's his animal hospital calling. Lots of people use spoofing for legitimate purposes all the time. It's, again, it's not just a, you know, a monolith. You can't look at it and say all spoofing is bad. Again, most well, just by the Just by the use of the word spoof tells me it's bad, that you've got to use that terminology. Yeah, it's got to, you know, it has a terrible my, connotation. My, and not, look, I'm not saying that robocallers aren't using it for illegitimate purposes, and that's not a problem that we need to work on. Right. What I'm saying is that as a, as a it, spoofing is a tool, and people are using it for legitimate purposes all the time. Uh, you know, somebody used the example of your pharmacy calling you. When you see CVS calling you, it's always CVS. How do they do that? Calling from multiple CVSs? Probably using spoofing. I can't say that for 100% sure, but spoofing is used all the time to maintain a consistent... Just uh, that phrase, Mr. Chairman, that spoofing is used for legitimate purposes strikes me as odd. I know I'm out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, you'll back. Well, thank welcome. you very much. The gentleman's time has expired, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Kentucky for five minutes. So following on the point he just made, so if, if one of us uses our personal sale, calls some constituent back, and it shows up U.S. House of Representatives, our, our office number, that's spoofing? Uh, By definition? I think you were saying using your mobile number? Yeah, using what? my own personal number, and the office number shows up on their caller ID. That Well, I, I, I just... Uh, what I was more saying is that if you're calling from an office number here, and it says U.S. House of Representatives, there's probably in the, a building that size hundreds of different phone numbers, mm. hundreds of different phone lines. The, the system... Uh, I think it's called a PBX, mm -hmm. is using spoofing so that you maintain that unique number that the person on the outside sees on their okay, caller ID. Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, thanks. I oh, just asked her if that was an example. So I got a question for the, all the, for the technology companies addressing this issue head on. Uh, Mr. Foss and Mr. Gar and Mr. Hambukin, do any of your companies approach the robocall problem by diverting calls to voicemail directly and have providers legitimate, uh, and have providers legitimate call origin, or originators or any regulators express concerns about that? I think you've touched on something really important, and, and the wording that we all use, again, the spoof, the setting of the caller ID, when we say blocking or stopping, um, labeling those, I think it's really important, you've touched on something really important. Uh, on our product, on mobile, when we say block the call, what we actually, that shorthand for, it goes directly to voicemail. Uh, one of the other representatives said, like, you know, if you don't answer it, it's just like declining it, and then they don't leave a message. Mm -hmm. right? That is incredibly safe because everybody misses calls all the time. Everybody's always kind of worried, oh, are we gonna miss? Like, we just dump it to voicemail. On our mobile product, when we say that we block a call or we stop a call, we actually prompt the user to type in a CAPTCHA. So it says, this phone is protected by Nomo Robo. Please type the number 3286, it picks a random number. And if they type it in, proving they're a human, we let the call through. So it's really important to understand that, right, blocking the call and making it disappear into the ether is not the right way to do it. But to take a, putting up a challenge, uh, getting them over to voicemail and then allowing the, the user to go and check that or to add that to their contacts, that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about stopping the call. It's really important. Okay. Any other answers for the other two of you? Sure. Uh, the, at First Orion, the approach we take is uh, we are labeling calls with scam likely when we know it's a scam. We also have other labels such as telemarketer or nuisance likely based on what we know about that number. And as I mentioned, we think consumers should have choice. And so consumers can see the label for any of these calls but can also have those calls uh, what we would call blocked. Mm -hmm. uh, scam likely calls, when we say blocked, they, they go away. They don't go to voicemail. All the other types of calls would go to voicemail. So if it was a telemarketer, a survey, account service, or some other type of label, those would go to your voicemail. Okay. Yeah, if I could just say, some originators have complained, but we feel very, again, our users are looking for control of their phones. It's their phones, not the originators, not anyone else's. There's a difference between legal and illegal versus wanted and unwanted, and our users are asking us to prevent unwanted calls. 
just because a debt collector, collector may be a legal telemarketer and just because a political robocall, and I understand why you guys may use them at times, may be uh, a legal call, that doesn't mean that the consumers want to receive them. So it's really important that we give them the control to do that. But again, we're forwarding the calls, uh, we're controlling, we're answering the calls that we're blocking that gives the users control over those calls to decide which, what to do with those calls after the fact. They can hear these answer bots. Okay, thanks, and Mr. Garl, I'll continue with you. What can be done to enhance consumer education from a parent's child who might be getting their very first smartphone, might be getting their very first smartphone for a senior citizen with a traditional landline and a mobile phone? Uh, again, I think there's a couple things that you should always be teaching people about their use of their phones. One is that caller ID is not something you can trust out of hand. And when someone calls you, unless it's someone directly that you know, a really trusted source, there's no reason ever to give them your personal identif personally identifying information. Especially when they're using time to put pressure on you, that's the time to push back and say, if this is a legitimate call, if this is a legitimate request, put it in writing, I'll be happy to answer you. Like I said, my grandfather always said, Honest people will always put things in writing, and I think that's a principle that we should always adhere to when we're thinking about these calls. But again, if you put something like RoboKiller on your phone and you get answer bots working for you, you're preventing these calls from ever even reaching you, and you're protecting yourself and the people around you. Okay, thank you, and I'm about out of time, so I'll yield back. Thank you very much. The gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you guys for taking the time on you know, on this day to just come and visit with us. You know, we all know it's a problem. It's just unique to find individuals that are putting so much time to it. Um, you know, used to, you could just kind of get rid of your landline and that solved the issue. Uh, and now even my cell phone is, is um, uh, my colleagues are sitting up here, their cell phones are being called now. So can, can you guys just kind of elaborate how effective are the do not call list from state to national? Uh, it, it, in, in, are they even worth the time that we put them in place? Go ahead, Mr. Falsi, you can help. Uh, so the do not call registry was created, you know, back in the, the early 90s with the TCPA, it was implemented in the right. early 2000s. Think of the world back then, right? We didn't have cell phones. We didn't, the internet didn't exist, right? Well, we did, but they were bag phones. Exactly, car phones, <laughs> right? The world has changed, right? So at that time, it was um, legitimate telemarketers, and there was no way to get off of the, you know, to tell them to stop. That made sense then as an opt-out mechanism, okay? Legal robocallers, they will go and follow the rules. Today, the robocallers don't follow the rules. They're, nobody's downloading the do not call. So it's like having a, you know, a don't rob me list Is and that all the criminals it's... have to go in and look, it just, it hasn't kept up with the time. I personally think that we should uh, clarify that everything is just opt in. If you are calling somebody to sell them something, to do anything with money, right, right, to collect a debt or something, I just think that you need to have expressed written permission. It would save a lot of this whole, you know, the patchwork of regulations and rules and, and clarifications and this law came in and this, you know, was taken about. If but it how was could you, opt in. How could you opt in because I don't think anybody gave them their phone numbers to begin with. Correct. So how would you? How would that system work? Because it's it's not enforceable the way that it is now. And I don't think anybody opted in to begin with. Correct. If it was opt in, and we could basically say, which is pretty much what we're trying to say right now, is that any of those types of calls are illegal, right? But and therefore, there, the my you know, point is, is that if you're already on the do not call list, it already is illegal but it's not being enforced. Well, that's now because of the whole, right, again, if they, you don't necessarily, if you're not on the do not call list and they call a right. landline, there's all these different kind of, the, 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 the truth in this lies in the, in the gray area, right? And then when the carriers, the different regulations and things where when it gets that one bad actor and they say, well, common carrier, we don't have to go, right? The, these criminals are always gonna go and look for that one little sliver and go and run through there. And at best, it's gonna take years to go and litigate. Right? If those things were more, do you, did you have express written permission to call that person? Okay, even, show it to me. Right? Even what you said earlier though, you don't need more regulations, more, you know, this just put in place. You actually would, if you put in an opt-in, you would have to have regulations that stated that you ought to opt-in, but then the enforcement arm is still there. Well, the enforcement arm isn't working on the do not call list, so explain to me how that would work, because we're all in. Yeah. I mean, I, we'd be all in on that. 
Do we need to give you know, the FTC or the FCC more broad powers, more teeth? Is that how that works? Because you you got to have it, regulations has got to take place for even the opt-in process. Yep. So let me give you an exact example of this, right? They're always kind of skirting around. So even when we, we talked about the definition. We know they're what, skirting around, right, right? What is an ATDF, right? What is an automated telephone dialing system? Now there's a lot of, a lot of the debt collection companies will, you know, HCI, they will manually push a button. They will have somebody which gets around all the TCPA laws, right? I just, I don't even care if those calls are made with an automated dialer. I don't care if it's made from a computer. I don't care if it's somebody that's pushing that button. If you're trying to do, to sell somebody, to scam somebody, to take some money, to something like that, yeah, you should not be able to do that. And then I think it would give more teeth to the FTC to go after these, and it so would give a lot less cover for the F or the FCC would uh, be able to give a lot less cover. All, all that is great, but it still goes back to the same thing. It doesn't make any difference if it's not enforceable. Correct. And, and I so think it, and if one of you guys, if someone else wants to jump in this, how would you enforce it? Ms. Um, I do think it's important that consumers have legal protections against unwanted robocalls. Uh, phone companies are reluctant to block uh, so-called legal robocalls. So if consumers don't have these protections, um, they won't be able to take advantage of some of the blocking. How would it be enforced? So that's what I'm trying to get to. How, does anybody have an idea how this thing could be enforced, how Congress could help it? push that to the next level. Truthfully, I don't think a do not call list is the solution. I, don't I agree. Think, well, it's not working, obviously. I don't think it can. I mean, there's even a theory that the do not call list actually empowers telemarketers because what they, if you take, a, if people get a call who are on the do not call list, they automatically by default think, well, it must be legitimate. I'm on the do not call list, so I'll answer this call. That So the telemarketer, you know, telemarketers have this theory, you know, have this thought that, hey, if I get someone on the do not call list, they're an even better target. I don't think legislation alone is the solution. I, again, it's I, I technology. Think, I think technology is the solution. So that, that leads my, to my question where I was trying to get to. So it, it's not regulation in your all's opinion. It's private. It's private. Uh, the private industry that's going to drive this, uh, the end to robocalls, essentially. We believe we're already doing it. We believe I answer bots are... I, sure. I, I would just add one thing. I, I think you're right in terms of technology and innovation is what's going to solve the problem. And uh, recently, over the last couple of months, the, the rules were clarified on enabling carriers to start blocking scam calls, uh, unwanted nuisance calls uh, for consumers. And so allowing that, allowing industry to start spurring innovation on top of that I think you're going to see an explosion over the next couple of years of solutions to combat the problem. Thank you. And I'm out of time. Thank you so much once again for being here and taking the time. Uh, this is something I feel like that we are going to be relying more and more on private industry to drive and help solve this problem, which is typically what happens in our country to begin with, which is great. The government's responsibility is to help you guys, you entrepreneurs, go out and thrive and, and create and solve problems or create opportunities. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And the gentleman's time has expired. And seeing no other members wishing to ask questions, I also want to thank our witnesses for today's uh, uh, hearing. Uh, it's been very, very informative because, again, it's, uh, it's an issue out there that we all hear about. And I tell you, as the gentleman from South Carolina that not only heard from the IRS, but the Social Security, <laughs> But, uh, you know, it's, it's an issue, and we hear it. And, you know, people say, what are we supposed to do? And uh, so, you know, some people, you know, I've heard, you know, in our districts, they actually fall for it, and they send the money in. And then all of a sudden they find out they're five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 out, and they don't have five or $10,000 to be out. So it's really important that, you know, uh, the, the public is protected out there, and that's what we're here to do. So again, I want to thank you all for being here, but before we do conclude today, I want to also include the following documents to be submitted for the record by unanimous consent. A joint letter from uh, multiple trade associations, a letter from the Electronic Privacy Information Center, a letter from CTIA, a letter from the U.S. Telecom, and a letter from the U.S. Chamber Institute for Legal Reform. Pursuant to com committee rules, I remind members that they have 10 business days to submit additional questions for the record. And I ask that witnesses submit the response within 10 business days upon receipt of the questions. And without objection, the subcommittee will stand adjourned. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you.